Okay, so today I'm joined by Coach Rob Beveridge, all the way from New Zealand. Co Rob's in uh, lockdown at the moment, and I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit about that as part of his frustration story. But this morning, we're going to talk to Rob a little bit about coaching, um, his experience as a coach, some of the frustrations and some of the highlights he's experienced. But Rob's also going to share some wisdom, hopefully, with us about what you can do in isolation and what things can help you stay ahead of the game when we return back to sport. Good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be, Rob. Yeah, good afternoon. Always good to be here, Jade. Yeah, I can imagine that you've been having some fun over there. 21 days, you said, in isolation. Yeah, 21 days. So I came over to New Zealand, uh, yeah, basically three weeks ago to take on a new contract with uh, a team called Southland Sharks in the New Zealand NBL, which um, you know, is one of the best franchises here. And uh, just a, a great organisation, uh, incredible facilities. I actually liken it to, to the, the Perth Wildcats of the, the New right. Zealand League. So um, quite well resourced, got the facilities. It's, you know, I'm trying to set up like a high performance centre and uh, uh, they've always been a, a top four team uh, in the league. So I was very, very much looking forward to coming over here. But uh, I got here and uh, you know, COVID-19 struck and... Uh, while I was actually in my 14-day quarantine, uh, that was compulsory for all all travellers. That uh, the prime minister uh, came in and, and and locked the country down in 48 hours, which was uh, an, am an amazing experience. But but I consider it incredible leadership. Yeah, I think I think Jacinta Ardern has shown incredible leadership during this time, and and we might even get onto leadership in sport if we have time. So. You weren't expecting that. You are expecting to go out and coach and, and build, as you say, this high performance type environment that you wanted to do. So how, does, how do you deal with that? What, what goes through your mind when suddenly you find out that you, you pretty much land on the ground and find that you're going to be locked up for 14 to 21 days? Well, you prepare yourself uh, that that I was going to be four to five months away from my family. That uh, you know, I came over here, so uh, it was one of those things that you know it's it's hard to say your goodbyes to your your family, and you you do a lot of work behind the scenes of of uh, you know building the program before you get here. A lot of planning, uh, a lot of a lot of meetings online, and uh, you, you then actually get really excited that uh, you know here I go. The, the times uh, arrive to go to New Zealand and. And uh, you know, a new challenge. You know, you know, I've been doing this a very, very long time, 28 years now. And, uh, yeah, you, you have your ups and downs, and, but this was something I was really excited about. New country, new league, uh, something I didn't really know too much about. Uh, but, but that was the challenge, was to, to uh, put, put a plan in place of how I could do it. And uh, basically, I got here and uh, straight away it was that the league's going to be postponed. And... Uh, and, and there's so many questions or when it's going to be and it, it was a moving landscape every single day. Uh, so the minute I landed, I was pretty much in quarantine and to, to find out that, you know, I couldn't leave the apartment, uh, you couldn't go to the stadium, you couldn't do anything. And, and, and it was interesting, you actually got treated a little bit like an alien. Mm. I felt that, uh, you, you know, People would be looking at you, and you know, you know, I avoided wearing Australian tops. So, like, you are actually let outside uh, to get some fresh air and a little bit of exercise. But it was a, it was a very, very different feeling to to get here, and so the the world was sort of turned upside down. That's something that I was so excited about doing, and you know, getting my teeth into, and uh, you know, trying to. Reinvent's not the word, but uh, whenever you take a new job on, you, you you've got something to prove. And uh, you want to hit the ground running and then all of a sudden you, you hit a wall. Yeah. And you've been doing this, you said you've been coaching for 20 something years. So you and I have known each other for a long time now. And many people probably, in, particularly in Western Australia and on the East Coast, know a little bit about your story. But tell us about some of the pre-MBL coaching stuff and some of the work that you've done in juniors and nationals and things like that. So give us a quick overview of your career as a coach. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a long and varied career, but but uh, you know, from a young age, you know, I I had a dream of being a basketball coach. You know, so from from sixteen years of age, I mean, I played rep basketball under 14, 16s, 18s, eighteens, twenties, the, the whole pathway, and you know, fringe national league. And but but I, but I was realistic. I wasn't very good. You know, I was too short, non athletic. Uh, so yeah, you know, but I made a decision. I wanted to be a coach. So so I got coaching young kids at a young age, and uh, 
and I, and I always believe that to, to be the best, you've got to surround yourself around the best people. You know, you, you, you've got to serve your apprenticeship. You, 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 you've got to do your homework. You've got to serve your due. So I started uh, coaching uh, mini ball. So all, all the way at the little tackers on, on little rings and work my way up uh, through coaching both males and females uh, teams uh, and I coached state teams, you know, you know under 16, and then I did under 18. So I ended up coaching, uh, you know, 15 national championships. So be, before I actually got into, you know, the, the the big league, if you want to call that professional coaching, I, I actually coached at uh, 15 national championships, and I had some really good success uh, during my my uh, junior national career. You know, I won a, a whole lot of national tournaments and stuff like that and got invited to national camps. And so, uh, again, uh, that, that opened some doors uh, by having a little bit of success. But it, it gave me uh, you know, a, an opportunity to work with some incredible people. And, uh, it, it, and the journey led me from uh, you know, coaching junior basketball through to going to university to, to doing you know some sports science degrees uh, and everything I did at university was it was almost an obsession that uh, I related everything that I could possibly learn to basketball yeah uh, and, and uh, everything from the physiology to the the anatomy to the psychology to the what whatever I could do uh, was associated with that but but what I found out the key to, to be successful is surrounding yourself around uh, great people and uh, grew up in Canberra. So I was able to go to the Australian Institute of Sport, which was you know, probably the leading uh, sports institute in the world. And uh, from there, um, I then followed uh, Adrian Hurley out to Perth in the, in the early 90s. Uh, he, he was the, uh, the coach of the, the national program. Now he he was dealing with you know some of the greatest players in in Ricky Grace and Andrew Vlahoff and Scott Fisher and those types of players. So you know I wanted to learn from people like him on how to deal with these superstars and uh, you know basically I, I I learnt my trade you know under some very very good coaches and and uh, you know as as things moved on you know I got involved as head coach for our national junior program and. Uh, that led on to we won a world championship. You know, lucky to have you know players like you know Andrew Bogut and Damian Martin. Uh, you know, Brad Robbins was in the team. Brad Newley, Alex Marich, uh, just a, an incredible group of uh, of players that that uh, have been part of their their life and their journey uh, for many many years. And that then led on to the, the national program with the, you know going to Olympic games and three world championships, two com games. So, you know, I've, I've had a, an incredible uh, career. There's no doubt about it. And uh, during that time, you have, you have your ups and downs. It's tough. You know, the, the, the life of a coach, there's no question. It, it, it's got its challenges. And, and uh, right, right now, it's, you, know, you know, I'm lucky that I've got a good network of people that I can lean on and uh, get me through these tough times. So how do you how do you do that? I mean, it's it's great to have good networks and support. That you know, that's a really good indicator of of success and happiness. But sometimes in these situations, we really have to look inside ourselves and and explore, come to it from a personal perspective. So how do you? What are the things that you look at to get through tough times? What skills do you rely on in yourself? Yeah, I think uh, part part of it is uh, the experience of, of travel. Uh, you know, I've 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 worked in you know many different countries. I've worked you know, up in uh, Japan, Korea, China, the Philippines. Uh, you know, I've worked over in the USA. I've worked in the Middle East. Uh, you know, I've worked in Europe. You know, with, with with different teams. So you get exposed to to, to different things and and. Uh, and it probably goes back to, you know, I look at how other people cope with different things or, or you know, really I, I like to plagiarise what other people do and uh, copy what the greats do. And uh, you know, that, that's something I always, you know, I like to, you know, I, I lean on mentors, you know, so you know, I, I like talking to people. I think uh, the communication between people is really important. But it's something that I really learn is you, you've got to keep your inner circle very, very small. Yeah. Uh, that I found particularly in professional sport that uh, you, you, you meet uh, you know, so many fans, so many sponsors, and, uh, and and during that part of your life, they want to be your best friend. You know where, uh, and what what you find is then when you might move on to another job, 
uh, you don't hear from them. You know, they're, they're gone. You know, so it's a real, that was a real big lesson that I learned that uh, you, know, you can only rely on a small certain amount of people that, uh, you know, you, you, you got, you've got to keep your inner circle small and, and mine is very, very tight. Uh, and, and obviously family's part of that. You know, that's probably one of the biggest things is that you, 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 your family, you know, unconditionally are, are there for you. You know, you've got a small group of friends that will be for, there for you as well. And that's a really good piece of advice because I think when you come up through from that pre-elite into that elite, you know, if we're going to talk about elite athletes for a second, when you come into that elite circle, everybody does want to give you some advice. Everybody does want to have input into your game and your success and your failures and that kind of thing. So it's a good piece of advice to for people in that sort of situation or getting to that point to listen to. So that's a good one. One of the other things that I want to talk to you about, I guess my area and my work with you is is that mental skills. So we've talked a lot over the years about mental skills for athletes and how important sports psychology is to athletes. I want to ask you a little bit about, do coaches use sports psychology and mental skills? And also, do they help you in understanding, two-part question, help you in understanding athletes? Um, oh, it's one of the most crucial things is, is sports psychology that, you know, when, when I talk to people, you know, to me, there are three components in, in uh, developing athletes. There's the, the, the physical side of things, which is, you know, your strength conditioning coaches, you get bigger, stronger, faster, things like that. Uh, you then have uh, the skill development, which is, which is me as the coach. You know, as coaches, we teach you how to shoot. We teach you how to, how to pass, you know, offences, defences. So you've got the, the skill component, you've got the physical component, and, and probably one of the biggest things that separates the good teams from the great teams is the, the sports psychology. It's the mental side of the game. And, and uh, you know, so I've been doing this a very, very long time, and, and that's probably one of the biggest areas is is getting to understand the athletes, you know, how, how they think, how they learn, their personalities, and, and that, that comes through uh, learning from the, the sports psychology perspective. So uh, everybody does physical conditioning. Everybody does the skill development. But, but coaches don't do enough of the, the mental side of the game. And, and to be honest, I think that that's probably has separated you know, my successes from other, other people's successes is the, the buy-in of, of sports psychology. And, and, the way, and I think a lot of people are scared of it, that they think that, psychology is you've got to lie down on my couch and tell me about all your issues and stuff like that where it's nothing to do with that at all I mean there's a small component but again that's not the 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 sports psychology that that I like to utilize it's Mm -hmm. it's teaching uh the the mental skills of the game of of positive self-talk of self-belief of of be able to you know have a, a attention on on, on what needs to be done, you know, to, to get rid of all the, you know, the white noise out there, all the negative stuff that, that happens. And, you know, I've seen it in, in this day and age in particular with social media. Uh, it is the worst thing that I've ever seen happen in sport, that everybody has a sense of entitlement, that they can uh, pass judgment, and particularly in sport, uh, that they're very critical of athletes. And, and, it, and it brings athletes down. So, you know, we as coaches and, and psychologists need to, to develop skills, uh, coping skills on, on how to handle different situations, what, what to believe and what not to believe. And, and uh, I guess put, you know, again, just like uh, teaching them how to shoot, you've got to teach them how to uh, focus uh, on the tasks in hand through goal setting, through little goals, through, you know, I've, you know I, we call them you know, those conscious commitments to, to doing something. You know, to, to put things in place that give you little wins, uh, things that are achievable, uh, that make you feel good about yourself, you know, to, to develop your self-esteem, your self-confidence. And that's probably the big package that, that needs to be given is a combination of all three. But uh, you know, I guess to, you know, the question is, no, coaches don't do enough of it. And that's, that's what we need to do more of. Yeah, and you make a really good point again when you talk about it's the little things daily. I think sometimes with sports psychology, in my experience, one of the things that I really like to teach when I'm doing it is that it's not about, it's not a light switch and it's not the big wins, it's the small daily steps that you can do every day towards achieving your goals and and setting yourself up for success. It's not the big stuff or the big moments. 
yeah, it, it becomes a habit. Like like anything you do, you just can't you know get a magic wand, tap somebody on the head, and why you're you're mentally tough. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't work that way. It's that constant, uh, you know, chipping away and, and developing uh, those, those skills to to cope with winning, losing, travelling, sickness, injury, all of those things. So you know, teach, teaching uh, skills to focus right now. And, you know, we, we call it, you know, follow the process. You know, that's a bit of a catch cry. But, you know, that, that's one of the biggest keys is for, forget about what's going to happen down the track, become great at something right now and add something on uh, tomorrow. Yeah. I want to change tact a little bit and talk about your observations as a coach, particularly, again, hopefully, you know, the goal of these, these interviews for me is to help kids sitting at home right now who are feeling really frustrated that they can't get out on the court or can't get out and play their sport. So I want to change direction and maybe you could give some advice on what is it as a coach do you, do you look for? So what things do you look for when selecting athletes and what things um, – impress you and then let's do the flip side and see what are the things that can rule somebody out so let's start with the things that impress a coach uh attitude you know it's it's uh i'm actually writing a book at the moment and uh, you know one of the components is is talking about what what i look for in athletes and as i said pe people can be great skill wise you know, have great skill set they can be physically great athletes but if they don't have the the, the right attitude of coachability uh listening wanting to learn wanting to get better you know so a, a lot of the time you know i, I might have a uh, a trial and it could be 60 70 80 people at a trial and this this has happened regularly in my my past is and then you've you got to say to the players there's 80 of you here and there's only 10 spots available so 70 people are going to miss out you know, so there's going to be some really good players that miss out. So I'm looking for the people that uh, are going to fit into my system of play. You know, but what does that mean? Well, they've got to give effort, you know, 100% effort in everything they do. You know, and I do little tests of, you know, we're doing a group environment and I might just start yelling out, you know, blow the whistle. And then it's like five, four, three, two, one. And see who is alert. See, so, you know, who's the first person in? You know, who, who's going to run in uh, there? And, and I always make a mental note that who's last. And, I, and I'll say to that person, don't be last twice. Be second last, but never, ever be last twice because I'm actually, you know, looking to probably rule more people out than, than in, a, you know, in a selection trial. So I'm looking for the people that are prepared to, to um, you know, show the enthusiasm uh, you know, be, you know, energetic, uh, you know, eye contact, little things like when I'm talking, you know, say, you know, you got to listen with your eyes, you know, so I want attention from everybody. So, because if I'm talking, I know they're listening uh, and they can, they can learn a, a, a lot, a lot quicker and things like that. But if you've got kids that are sidetracked and they're pinching other kids and they're, you know, they're the last person in or they're dribbling the basketball as I'm talking, that, those mental notes to me are going, you know, I don't really know if, um, you know, they're, they're part of, they're going to be part of my group. Yeah. You know, so really it's the attitude and the enthusiasm, uh, how positive they are. Um, and particularly in a team sport, it's, it's, it's not about them. It's, a, you know, it's, it's not the individual. It's how are they actually going to fit into a group environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, particularly, you know, from it just, you know, being with national teams for, for a long time is you're travelling away for up to six weeks at a time. And if you're sharing rooms and sharing meals and buses and train ride, you know, you name it, you, you got to, you, it does get to you. And if you're a very, very selfish individual and not prepared to help others and things like that, it becomes a real grind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we, you know, in a team environment, what I look for is, is, you know, the attitude, where do they actually fit into the team? Yeah. So I didn't hear you once then say the only thing you're looking for is skills and strength. So it's really about that, that mental side as well in selection processes. So it's really, really important. And I guess with everybody in isolation right now, with everybody sitting at home, that's something actually we can be reflecting on and working on. So what, in closing, what would be your advice to everybody who's sitting at home right now, feeling frustrated, um, hoping that sport's going to come back in, in one, two, three, four, five, hopefully not, but maybe six months. What's your strongest piece, strongest piece of advice 
as a coach for those kids? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it will happen. You know, we're, we're not going to be in lockdown for the rest of our lives. We don't know. It could be six weeks. It could be 12 months. You know, we, we just don't know that. But, but, but uh, you know, always I look at the analogy is that, you know, if, if my season's starting in October for a National League team, you don't start in October. You know, you actually start months out, months out uh, in, in regard to, you know, physical development. You know, so, you know, you, you've got to be in shape. So, you know, when, when we get out of this, uh, you, you've got to be in some sort of shape. So, but if you're just going to sit back on your lounge and feel sorry for yourself and, you know, just sit there and watch TV and be on PlayStation and, and things like that, you're going to be behind the eight ball because, again, if I've got 80 kids at a selection trial, uh, I'm, I, I'm only taking 10, you, you, you want to be in that 10. So you want to give yourself an advantage. So I mean, there, there's the thing from the physical well-being side of things that, you know, what, what can you do? Well, uh, you, you know, things I'm telling my kids. I mean, I'm over here in New Zealand and I'm talking to them, well, get out the backyard there and set up a circuit. So it could be a skill development circuit. So, you know, you might, you know, have 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, and you might set eight stations up where you're doing ball handling, you know, you're doing some dribbling, you're doing some passing against the brick wall, uh, you, you're doing step ups, you know, have a look at your yard, have a look at, you know, your, your setup, uh, push ups, incline, decline, sit ups. Uh, lunges, squats, you know, set that set yourself up. So during the day, you know, define a, a moment of your day of what could I do from a, a physical development perspective. You know, get your heart rate up by doing step ups, skipping, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, we've got an incline on our on our property. We'll run up and down the hills. Set yourself, uh, you know, four sets of ten sprints. You know, so you've got to think outside the square of what you can actually do in that environment. Uh, I believe in uh, copying. You know, I talk about you know plagiarism. See what the great players do. Watch some video on on some of the great players. What do they do? What separates those people? So when you're watching TV, go 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 to you know get on the internet and research some of the great players and Michael Jordan's, the Kobe Bryant's, the, whoever it might be, whatever sporting industry you're in. Have a look at what they do and take some notes you know, and rewind things. See how they come off an on-ball screen. How do, what's their shooting technique like? Have a look at that. So, you know, again, that, that's something we don't do enough of is, is, is having a look what other people do. And I think that's, that's important. And, uh, and, and then just little things of um, do something else to, to distract you as well. Because, you know, you, I think what happens is when you're by yourself and, you, you know, I've, I'm here 21 days by myself in a room and you get in your own brain and, you know, I find that um, a lot of the time you, 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 there's a lot of negative talk. You know, I, I like, like it to a, a little birdie sitting on your shoulder just talking, you know, chirping away in your head about how, how, how tough life is, how bad this is. And, you know, you've got to get rid of that bird. So you need to distract yourself by doing other things. You know, research, read, watch different documentaries, ring, ring people, you know, have online face-to-face -face conversations with people. Get off the PlayStation. You know, let let you know let let your brain be free. Uh, you know, even little things of go outside and take your shoes off and walk walk on uh, you know on the lawn. You know, have a look outside and you know like smell the roses. You know, sometimes I mean a lot. You know, this is a tough time and a new experience for us all. But you know, you know, I I, I look back at people in a lot worse situations than what we are. Yeah, we are very, very lucky that, uh, you know, with the technology and the, the medicine that we have, we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, but right now, you've got to take care of your, your own well-being and, and uh, you know, I think try and do as many positive things as you can and communicate with people and develop relationships uh, and do something different. You know, tr just test yourself and do something different rather than uh, sitting there and feeling sorry for yourself. Lots of wonderful tips there. For anybody watching, um, Rob, I really appreciate your time today. I'm, I'm glad I was able to break it up for you for a little bit today. Thank you. And I wish you lots of luck with the book. I want to have a, I want to be one of the first to read your book and lots of success when you get back here to Oz. Take care. Thanks, Jade. And you're actually in the book, by the way. Ah, I can't wait to read it then. <laughs> Thanks, Rob.